Welcome to episode 82 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast, joined again by Mary, a woman who should have spent many more days in the convent while I was busy flunking out of seminary school. I am merely a dented halo named Darren. What's going on, Mary? How are you? Oh, God. I was <laughs> not well, well, there's expecting a theme to that. that. I know well, there is. There's a theme to that. So yeah, so uh, so yeah, what's going on? We, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. But what's going on with you? Not much. We had a great weekend in Baltimore. We got to see some baseball. We got to see some uh, Civil War related graves, including Joseph E. Johnson and Trimble, as well as the Booth family plot and all that. So that was pretty cool. How are you? Yeah, been pretty good. And don't forget a short period of running for our lives for a little while. But that was I good. know exactly. Yes, that was like Baltimore riots. 2.0 ironic <laughs> in the same road it's kind of funny how it how was a uh, circle of life so anyway yes yeah, so we got some so we got some business to do tonight mary but before we do. do we have to we have to do our tradition but you know what are we drinking here so i guess we'll, we'll i guess i'm the host so i guess i have to do this so what are you what are you drinking i'm drinking um life in the clouds which in a way pays tribute to the seminary because when you're up in that cupola like i've and you've been up in a couple of times you feel like you're in the clouds and that's by collective arts brewing and i'm drinking it out of the mug that i bought at the seminary ridge museum which totally gives away what our episode is <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna figure it out by now i don't want to tell you um i am drinking it is a yingling black and tan courtesy of the state of the great state of Pen commonwealth of pennsylvania i want to screw that one up and i am drinking it out of my tudor hall mug speaking of mugs that we have because i don't have a seminary mug museum i'm not as cool as i as you guys do <laughs> so Speaking of the Seminary Museum, Mary, we have a special guest tonight we, we got to talk about. So I'm going to introduce him. He is Peter Mealy, Mary. He's, um, he's the executive director of the Seminary Ridge Museum um, and Education Center. A little background, he's from northern New Jersey, so I don't even want to ask what baseball team he likes, if I have a suspicion. Okay. He, uh, he got his bachelor's degree at Ramapo College, uh, his master's at Schippenberg University, and he's working on his PhD at Penn State in Harrisburg. He's... Um, like I said, he's the executive director, and he also has a better beard than me. So I don't know. This is this isn't starting too well. So well, welcome, does. Peter. What's going on? Welcome, welcome aboard. Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. And I I am drinking uh, from the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the great borough of Gettysburg, a uh, Hop Hat IPA from Four Score Brewing. Can't really one of our see favorites. Or really see it there, but uh, yeah, one of my favorites. I am a member of the Four Score Core. Uh, mug club and Darren is yep there you go it's uh it's uh my favorite place to go in in Gettysburg but yes I am from northern New Jersey and uh I am from that that other team in the in the AL East who uh is in the first place right now um beating beating out the the Orioles and every step of the way Which I don't know where the season that? started yet so yeah oh, yeah say anyway, your team so. <laughs> What's your team? The Yankees. Oh, uh, unfortunately, I figured as much, but it's okay. uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> although although I do, I do have a. Uh, when I moved to this area, I started, you know, kind oh of. Oh my God! You, how do you get a Walgreens hat? <laughs> well, I bought it. I, I, I am one of those fair weather fans that bought it oh, after they won the World that's Series. That's okay. Well, he's got a Washington Nationals, which is a pretty cool thing. And yeah. you know, this, you know, this, this, you know, nothing around the Yankees. I mean, there, you know, there are twelve-year-old kids in New York City walking the streets who've never seen a World Series title. So you, you got to feel bad for those kids. <laughs> hey, so, I will I grew, always. I grew up be... in the the nineties. Oh, I grew up in the mid. Uh, I was a Yankee fan starting in in the mid 90s so you know if you're gr oh. living in northern new jersey and growing up in that jeter dynasty uh there was nothing better than the 96 to 9 and then 2000 stretch and then we've been disappointed ever since well <laughs> i guess it depends on which, how well, you look my, at it but that's okay my team of cleveland you know nine or 2016 that world series was mm -hmm. uh like the great halt mm -hmm. at uh that, you know Cedar Creek. That's exactly what yeah. that was. Great halt when the rain delay came in. But uh, the last time my team won a World Series, uh, Civil War veterans were alive. So that's kind of what I hold on to. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. where I'm going with that. <laughs> I'm proud of that fact. Definitely. So I've got some business to talk about here, Mary. So, you know, we have Peter on. Look, obviously, we're going to talk about the seminary. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, anybody who's been to Gettysburg knows about the Lutheran uh, Theological Seminary at Gettysburg. It's got a long history before the war. Um, you know, during the, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, and of course, since then. Um, and we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about some of the cool things that go on nowadays, Mary, at the seminary. Um, you don't get into church all that much or anything like that, so you probably wouldn't know. But there's other stuff that goes on. They are open BF besides Sunday. So I think we're going to talk more about some of the things that go on here. And what's great about Peter is he's one of the, one of the gurus here. 
and uh, we'll probably bring him on to talk about it. So Peter, yeah, I guess we can kind of get started with this is, um, you know, talk maybe a little bit of how you got involved in um, yeah. the seminary and how, how, you're, how you've kind of progressed through it. So, yeah, thanks. So it, believe it or not, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before was the ninth anniversary of my job offer. Uh, which was which was pretty cool. It showed up on my Facebook memories. But I I moved to Gettysburg from northern New Jersey in, in early 2013 in January. And I lived on West Middle Street behind the courthouse. And every day I would walk just to get out of my apartment. I'd walk up Middle Street, cut through the seminary, and then back down Chambersburg Street. And so I would pass the seminary building which I knew was being turned into this new museum. And I was trying to get into museum work. I was a, a student in a master's program at the time. So I passed this building almost every day and I would think to myself, oh my God, wouldn't it be so great if I could get a job there? This new museum that I know is opening up. And so that uh, April, um, April, early May, I applied for a job entry level position as a visitor services assistant and uh, was hired and was in the cupola on July 1st, 2013, 150 years to the minute, to the minute wow. that Buford was up there and uh, got to give tours to James McPherson, uh, uh, who Corbett, Tom Corbett was the governor of Pennsylvania at the time. Pat Toomey. Uh, so they were all there. So I got to give these tours to these dignitaries. And then at the end of that year, I moved into a full-time position in operations, which turned into education, which sort of brought me up to being named the executive director uh, two years ago at the end of this month. So uh, long story short, I've been with the organization since before the doors opened. And it's been a it's been a wild ride. It continues to be a, a wild ride. And being able to, it, I, I still have moments where I'm walking through that building and I'm going, I really get to to be here and do this, because it's such an iconic structure of the Civil War. But even beyond the Civil War, I mean, it was it, it the, the building was built. 30 years before the Battle of Gettysburg. So it has this long storied history of being a school uh, for theologians from 1832 up to the battle. And then, and then after the battle, it returns to that. So it, it's just the, the people that walk through those halls and the, and the stories that are sort of held in the walls of that building uh, are, are important to the Civil War, but both, but transcend the Civil War, transcend uh, just those three days or the Battle of Gettysburg. So it's been a really great place to work and to be able to uh, design the visitor experience and uh, and welcome hundreds of thousands of people through. So I'll stop right there for, for now. <laughs> I know that Kind of dumped yeah. a lot, but that's awesome. Yeah. You mentioned it runs right around eighteen thirty. It started, of course. It's, yeah. it's the oldest. It's the oldest um, functioning uh, Lutheran church in the country, and still founded mm -hmm. by um, Samuel Simon Schmucker, who has a has a building named after him right on your campus over there. Yep. Uh, and it, you know, it's certainly one that um, it's a, it's a building everybody knows, and it's got a lot of history to it. So, um, you know, we thought we'd talk more about how it, it functioned in the battle, and I think you know when you look at the Battle of Gettysburg, you know. They, almost every building was going to be used as a hospital. Yep. And, you know, and, and this one certainly was on both sides. So, you know, um, it was, as you, as you aforementioned a little bit ago, um, July 1st, 1863, the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg is kind of really when it kind of took its, you know, took its uh, wings and took off. And that's where famously, you know, Brigadier General uh, John mm -hmm. Buford of the Cavalry was up there looking, you know, he was a commander of the 1st Division of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of the Potomac. And, um, and he was, you know, opening this battle of, you know, west of Seminary Ridge, um, and he's going to witness the arrival of the first corps to John Reynolds, um, who's going to come marching in uh, for relief from himself. So you can kind of still go up there and you can still kind of, you know, imagine and still see what he saw. And sometimes you swear you're down looking up, you swear you see him up there still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really, I mean, the, the, the building, the, the, the importance in... The Battle of Gettysburg is going to start on June 30th, as mm -hmm. Buford is going to ride into town uh, from Emmitsburg up Washington Street past Tommy's Pizza, Fourscore, 
and he's going to look out towards towards the west, and he's going to see Johnston Pettigrew's brigade, which has come in on the afternoon of, of June thirtieth. And Pettigrew's brigade is going to pull back out of town, and Buford's going to kind of follow. Uh, but Buford is going to arrive on Seminary Ridge and is going to recognize sort of what's going on, what's the importance of the town of Gettysburg and the roads that are going to uh, join there. And uh, uh, believe it or not, the seminary is the, the longest occupied ground uh, by one or the other armies in the entire Battle of Gettysburg, because from June 30th until July 5th, it's going to be occupied by first the men of Buford's division, and then going to turn over into, into Confederate hands. But uh, Buford is going to send his signal officer, Aaron Jerome, up to the cupola that, that night of June 30th. And he's going to say, look for campfires, and in the morning, look for dust. And that's exactly what Jerome is going to do. And uh, Buford is, may have been up there on the evening of June 30th as well, but he's certainly going to place his vedette lines based on what either he or Jerome can see from the cupola and covering those major approaches uh, to Gettysburg. So the view from up there, what we like to say is that the view from up there really sets the stage uh, for the first day, which is eventually going to set the stage for July 2nd and July 3rd. And it's going to be what does Buford and Jerome see from up there and how does it influence the decisions that they, that they make. Um, and then, of course, on the morning of, of July 1st, Buford's going to be up there watching the battle unfold to the west, turning to the east, watching for reinforcements from John Reynolds. And uh, at, at some point, uh, as Jerome writes, uh, that he's going to see the core flag of General Reynolds. And, uh, you know, if you have any, I'm sure everybody who, who who's watching has seen the movie. I was going to say, we many, all know many, that many, scene. Many, many, many times. And. Uh, you know, that, that, that account of Reynolds riding up and, you know, what goes John, the devil's to pay, that all comes from uh, a letter from Aaron Jerome, the signal officer. So that's one of the historic records uh, that, in, and, and that exact exchange is written in Jerome's letters. Uh, so it could have happened. Uh, but in any event, you know, from Buford is probably going to see Reynolds from up there, and then Buford is going to have some sort of conversation with Reynolds, either from the cupola or down on the ground. Uh, Mary, the, the the image that you have on your coffee mug is yep. is uh, yes, it's... is Bu Buford and Reynolds meeting on the on the ground in front of the seminary. Yeah, because I would. And, I mean, uh, I mean, we've all been up in the cupola. Yeah, I can't imagine them being like, "Hey, how's it going from the like the cupola to the ground?" Like they would have been shouting. I would imagine. Wayne, any, Wayne Mox and I did it one day where we tested it. Now, Wayne, everybody probably who's watching this knows Wayne too, yeah. who's extremely loud. <laughs> yes. Um. So you know, you'd have to be as loud as Wayne Mox to hear from the ground to the cupola. Did it work so then? Maybe, so it's... yeah, yeah. Maybe that tells you something about about Reynolds and and Buford. Wow. So the shouting might have worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's yeah. just no question about it. And you know, and obviously, as the battle's going to go on, uh, the Union lines of McPherson Ridge, you know, the West of Summit, they're going to get driven back. We're not talking about the whole first day of battle at Gettysburg here, but suffice to say, the Confederates are going to take the territory. And you mentioned that as long as. Um, longest held. There's going to be uh, guys like Penner's division. Dorsey Penner's okay. going to break that Union line. Um, the first corps is going to break first. Mary, we're going to take care of that right off the bat. Let's get that out of the way now. Instead of the 11th corps, we talked about that many, many times. <laughs> and it's going to help that delaying action. You know, the Union is going to is going to retreat back to the town. Um, you know, it's led by the famous Iron Brigade and all that stuff we talked about. Um, and there's really no more real infantry combat that takes place really at that point on. That and Robert Lee is going to take over the area. He's going to have his headquarters there. And it's probably a good question for you, Peter. You probably get this all the time, but it is debated whether or not Robert E. Lee himself got to the cupola or not. And it depends on who, who you, like any of this yeah. stuff, it depends on who you talk to. Me personally, I think it's a cool view. If I was in charge, I'd want to go up there to check it out. So I'd like to think he probably did, but what do you think? Yeah, so the, the, the way that I answer that question when I get asked many times is that 
uh, he he should not have been up there. Mm-hmm. That by the time that the Confederate Army takes the ridge, the building is a field hospital. And under the law, military laws at the time, if it's being used as a hospital, it should not should not be used for military purposes. So the one eyewitness account that we have of Lee being up there comes from Levi Graham of the 149th Pennsylvania, who had been a, was at the time, a, uh, a prisoner in the hospital. He had been helping one of his comrades into the seminary hospital on the afternoon of July 1st, and he gets caught in there as the building falls into Confederate hands. So he writes that he sees Lee up there. Now, the issue is that Graham is writing this in 1909. So we're looking at 46 years later. Uh-huh. Uh, the, other, the other factor that I tend to think about is Lee's health on July 2nd and July 3rd. Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely. There's the story of W.W. Blackford coming up to uh, Lee's headquarters on the night of the second and watching Lee, you know, leave and go behind his tent multiple times, doubled over in pain and being told that, uh, that, that General Lee is suffering from diarrhea. So, you know, is the general going to want to climb up four flights of stairs and two ladders to get up to the cupola where, you know, I, I, so I just, I throw that in as a, as a, you know, not to, not as any defamation against Lee, but just as a, as a practical question, you know, is he going to want to take that chance if in the span of a half hour, he's going behind his tent three times. So I don't know. Yes. Well, then everybody, obviously like with most of this stuff, you know, you, you, there are no absolutes in the right. talk of no. civil war, because that's the, even the story we talk about the, you know, the devil's the pain, all that it's people write it down, but you never know. And that's why when people say this happened, that happened, you know, um, I like to think you went up there just because, because mm-hmm. he imagined it. But again, you, there's many reasons why, you know, um, that, as you mentioned, he, maybe he didn't want to, you know, climb stairs in a situation he was in. But yeah. in any case, who, who knows? You never. Who you knows? knows? And, and that's you that's know? totally true. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But it's 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 fun to speculate how these type of these bar type conversations and wonder what that is. But you know, and you know, as you mentioned, Peter, it was turned into a field hospital, yep. and uh, and it was certainly one that um, was one of the more gruesome ones, and it's one of the more famous ones. A lot of people on both sides were there, um, and kind of if and it was been to an hour. I know we're going to talk more about the museum here in a little bit. But certainly anybody who goes in that building today and isn't sure what the purpose of that was is going to know pretty quickly that it was a hospital. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so as the Iron Brigade, well, let's back it up half a step. Um, I, I contend, and, and nobody has, has proven me wrong yet, but that the seminary is one of the only, if not the only, site on the Gettysburg battlefield that serves in three roles in terms of hospital care, that it was a primary aid station for Buford's division, or Gamble's brigade, Mm -hmm. uh, that it then goes and becomes a field hospital for the men of the first division of the first corps, which we know that is true, that it's, it's set up as a division field hospital for the Iron Brigade and Cutler's Brigade. And then it turns into administratively a general hospital uh, sometime around July 22nd. So there, there's actually some, some nuances there to, to the hospital period. Uh, when it becomes a field hospital, when the Iron Brigade and, and Cutler's Brigade come up, it is only supposed to be accepting men from the 1st Division of the 1st Corps. And for the for a large part of the morning, it probably is. And then as the battle comes really almost literally to the back door of the seminary with the last stand and the barricade fight about four o'clock in the afternoon, you start to see men of the, of the third division of uh, Roy Stone's Bucktail Brigade and, um, and Biddle's Brigade end up in the hospital. And that's where you see a lot of guys from the 151st, which is my background, uh, end up in the, in the seminary hospital. And uh, then by 
July 22nd, as, as hospitals are being consolidated in, in Gettysburg, you end up basically with, with two hospitals, with Letterman on the east side of town and the seminary on the west side of town. And somebody said to me, well, why, why the seminary? Uh, this was on a, a live stream. And I was like, um, well, wait a minute. It's the perfect place for a general hospital. It's got good drainage. It's got good airflow, which was very valuable to, people, to, to, to thinking about medicine in the 19th century. So it makes sense that it would be a hospital for a long period of time. And uh, the last patient that leaves is George McFarland of the 151st Pennsylvania. And uh, he leaves in September, mid-September of 1863. So two and a half months after he's dragged in the, the north entrance of the building. Wow. <laughs> that's, so uh, that's how long it lasted for as a hospital then? Uh, two and a half months. And, and so when the seminary wow. closes, I think that the the last, the, well, the last hospitals is Letterman, which is November. Yep. But the seminary, and one of the reasons that the seminary ceases to be a hospital is the, the seminary board is le really leaning on the, the government to, to get out because they have a fall semester that's starting. And the seminary board in August votes to put together a commission to send to Washington DC if they need to, to prevail upon the Supreme military authorities to get the hell out of our building because we have, to, we have students to teach and they don't have to do that because the seminary is vacated on September 16th but on September 24th, classes start in the building. So eight days between the time the last patient leaves and, and until classes start again. Wow. Yeah. That's wow. So were there like during that time when it was a hospital, like after the, the battle, what it was union and Confederates yeah. that were, were in there. My one question is, and I think I've read this somewhere before was Isaac Trimble. One of yep. the ones that was, Yep, it was uh, Trimble, Kemper. Oh, wow. Yep, uh, Henry Kidd Douglas and um, Ro Robert Powell, who's the Colonel of the 5th Texas. We've seen two of four of those graves, right, Darren? Yeah, I took a Kid Douglas was a tough one to find, but we found him over there in Shepherdson. We, yep. uh, mm -hmm. find, you know, he's, he's a tough one. He's towards the back. But when we just saw yeah. Trimble this past weekend, and the reason uh, Trimble was of interest to me is because um, I've been to Johnson's Island in, uh, in Sandusky, Ohio. Um, yeah, that's that where area. They... And that's where they sent him. It was a, yep. an officer's prison camp. And it was Simon Cameron, the former Secretary of War, that alerted President Lincoln. He said, uh, Trimble knows a lot about railways. You might want to do something about that guy. And, and there's some, some really interesting stories about people from Gettysburg, uh, just kind of visitors coming to see these, these four Confederate celebrities. Oh, and really? Yeah, yeah, and and Henry Kidd Douglas, uh, the heartthrob that he is, is very popular amongst uh, ladies coming in, and uh, uh, so they, he's, he they sneak him out, and they they go out on the town. Um, there's a, a story that's written uh, in a diary uh, by a chaplain. I think he's from the 19th Virginia, and he writes about some women are there and. Uh, and want to go from Trimble's room into Douglas's room. And the Pennsylvania militia are not, who are guarding the building, are not going to let him in. And I think Kemper and Trimble are in the same room. And Kemper pulls a knife on the militia. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And oh my and, gosh. And I mean, it's like a pocket knife or something, but it so unnerves the 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 I mean, and, and this, this chaplain that's writing this has no love whatsoever for the Pennsylvania Dutch militia, uh, very derisive against them. And they end up, they, 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 he lets the, these ladies pass from, from one of the rooms to, to, the, to the other. So there's this, uh, and then and now, now you've got me going. 
um, Trimble goes on a hunger strike. I've heard about that before. Yeah, yeah. Oh. He he talks about uh, it's the Patriot Daughters of Lancaster who write that Trimble wants the best food cooked and. He, if, if it's not the best food, he won't eat it. And then one day they bring him like fried ham and eggs. And I'm like, yeah, come on, bring it on. And he refuses to eat it. And, and they say, well, you know, leave it for him until his appetite improves. And eventually he does. Essentially, they're not going to bring him anything else. He's, it's, it's this or nothing. But he's about to be sent to a prison yeah. camp on Lake Erie. Yeah. You know, so it, it, there, there are these what's really interesting to me is when you look at sort of the period between July 22nd and September, which is it, you know, by July 22nd, all of the immediate, you know, sort of hair on fire cleanup is, is done for, for all intents and purposes. So you have this period of time where it's sort of like, it's not, you know, that things have calmed down, but they sort of have in terms of it, it's just kind of sort of this day-to-day -day routine of, hmm. of hospitals in Gettysburg. And, and you see sort of these human interest stories of these little kind of vignettes of, yeah. of interesting stuff that, that goes on. So that, that's what really interests me. Like, how are they dealing like with the day-to-day -day stuff on like August 13th? Like what's, what, what, what has happened? Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah. just an arbitrary day. Yeah. And that's, that's what we like talking about the podcast. So to know that stuff about Trimble and Henry Kidd Douglas is really interesting. Cause I mean, I didn't know any of that about them at yeah. all. And, and that's really fascinating to know that just as they're there in the hospital, you know, just and, hang essentially hang it. Like what, what are they doing? Like, yeah. you know, they're having visitors and yeah. Pulling knives it just, on it just shows the, It just shows the human side of these people. Exactly. Yeah. We're so used to reading these people in the the books, the Coddingtons and the Fonzes of the world that make it sound like, you know, na just names on a page. And then you, you'd find out these stories of, you know, Trimble refusing to eat eggs. You know, we, maybe you wanted to scramble. They try to stick him with the sunny side off, but he wasn't having it. You know, you know, like, they've been there. You know, he tried to send it back. It was probably the original Karen, actually, is probably what it was. You know? Isaac Trimble's the original Karen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let me talk to the manager of the cupola you know well that needs but to be he, a meme now oh, Trimble yeah, with exactly. Karen here. <laughs> <laughs> but um but again it's great and obviously the kids the kid Douglas stories are legendary especially you know with the, with the women and stuff like that and you know if you read his if you read his book I wrote with Stonewall yep. he definitely he definitely uh, did a lot more than writing with Stonewall so it was, it was a lot more fun reading about that stuff and again humanizing some of these guys but I think it's cool when you talk about it because a lot of you know, famous Civil War people you know, went through there, um, and it still it still casts such a large shadow on the whole battlefield. You know, people will talk about you know Cemetery Hill being the focal point on day one, day two, and day three, but I think when you show a picture of you know of um you know old dorm there, you know the uh, the, the cupola building, it, you you really see it, it really brings out the Gettysburg, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's why it's great what they ultimately did is they made into a museum. Yeah. And so for years, I've been going to Gettysburg way more times than I should. And you drive by and you'd see it. And, and now when they finally opened it up, it kind of really continues to tell that story in a real 3D type of a type of environment for people to really study. And that's, and that's where you come in as far as what you, what you do. So I guess, you know, talk about, you know, the beginning of the, um, the, maybe the original concepts of this museum, yeah. how it all kind of came together and, how, and what, you, you know, how do you think it's going? Yeah, so the, the, the story really starts back in the 1950s because the building in, in and I guess it's going to kind of starts back in 1895. In 1895, the seminary is expanding, uh, attendance is, is picking up, and the seminary constructs Valentine Hall, which is the building to the immediate south of the seminary. Uh, still is today the administrative center of the seminary. And when they do that, uh, the what's now the museum Schmucker Hall is turned into a dormitory and actually one of the colloquial names for it is old dorm uh and by the 1950s the building is in a pretty bad state and uh uh the commonwealth comes in and says look if people are going to continue to live here you've got to bring this building up to code fire code 
uh, and there's this a lot of this back and forth about what what do we do about the building? Do we sort of gut the inside and build a fireproof structure within the shell of this building? Uh, but ultimately, the seminary realizes that it's more cost effective to just construct brand new dorms. And with that comes the decision to actually knock Schmucker Hall down. And uh, from 1954 to 1959, there's this back and forth over knocking the building down. Uh, you, you see, you read board minutes and they say, yeah, by the next time we meet, the building's going to be gone. And luckily for, for everybody, there's a sort of a consortium of people that come together, licensed battlefield guides, the Adams County Historical Society, the National Park Service is involved about what can we do to save this building. So it's a very sort of in the early stages of the historic preservation movement in the nation, what are we gonna to do to save this building? And ultimately uh, the historical society moves in and they inhabit the building for about 50 years. And by the late 2000 teens, mid to late, uh, the building now has not been updated since 1895. And so there's no modern HVAC system, uh, substandard bathrooms, the electric is shot, no fire suppression system. Basically, it's, it's either going to fall down or burn down or something. And uh, in, the, in the early, in the late 90s, the seminary had established a, a 501c3 nonprofit foundation with the objective to care for the historic buildings on campus. And so about 2011, they start this campaign, uh, get some historic tax credits and are able to uh, essentially get about $15 million to rehab the building, turn it into a museum, put the walking trail in, put the parking lot in. And uh, that's uh, raised through historic tax credit financing, donations, uh, government spent, government grants, et cetera. Because that's a long technical way of saying that, uh, uh, of sort of establishing how we came to be. Um, but it's a it's a straight case of adaptive reuse that that they saw this building and. Um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know which, I was never in the building be before it was the museum. I, but I've seen pictures and, uh, and apparently it was just, it was, it was just had gotten to the point where it needed a, a major rehabilitation to, to, to maintain. And, uh, and the other, the other part of that is for many, many, many years, access to the cupola was restricted. Uh, due to safety mm -hmm. concerns and and insurance, and I remember talking to Wayne Motts, and when when Wayne was the director of the historical society, he didn't go up there, and I thought to myself, well, damn, if Wayne didn't go up there, then there really must have been a concern. <laughs> um, so, you know, the historical society would lead tours twice a year, and it was was a was a premium fundraiser, um, but now we offer tours six times a day. And that's part of the rehab of the building is, is not just the exhibits and what you see in the building, but you get this view that was instrumental in the Battle of Gettysburg. Yeah, and that makes it like, I mean, that's why preservation is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can be where they were. And I mean, I'm someone who has worked in the conservation field. I have a, like, I mean, that's one of my <laughs> degrees is in, in museum conservation. I understand the background that goes into that. It's so much. Um, so to be able to be in that cupola yeah, is to know the work that had to go into making that happen is, is really amazing. But the fact that you get to be where, where Buford and Jerome were and to mm -hmm. see their view is is really remarkable. Now, I, I will take a step in and, and say that, as many people point out, it is not the original cupola. It's not, yeah. And 
it's the same space. It's the same height. And frankly, I think it's the same floor that Buford stood on. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for the, for the listeners who don't know the full story, uh, in August of 1913, about a month after the 50th anniversary of the battle, there's a huge storm in Gettysburg and, um, a bunch of houses catch fire, but uh, the building is struck by lightning, uh, the, the, the weather vane on top of the cupola, and it starts a fire. And uh, from what we understand, the fire burns the cupola to about the roof line, but the flooring as it is today was covered with tin at the time. And if you look as you're going up to the cupola, you can see that the wood that is on the underside of the cupola is very similar to the wood that's original in the building. So we suspect that, yes, the fire destroyed everything ab above where you're standing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was rebuilt to the original specifications, but the flooring that you're standing on is the flooring that Buford and Jerome were standing on. So, Needless to say, you you are at the height. You are seeing the the view that Buford saw. Yeah, and that's that's very cool, and that's why that tour is is so worth going on to see that view and to have explained, you know, not just the the history of the seminary itself, but what the building was used in the battle. But to get that kind of the bird's eye view to what they were seeing, mm -hmm. to what Buford was seeing that day, why he made the decisions he made and to know where he saw Reynolds coming in mm -hmm. on the morning of July the 1st is very cool. Yeah. And, and it, it, uh, first of all, every time I go up there, I, I feel like I see something different and, mm -hmm. and uh, there were some dead trees that were on the seminary property that recently got taken down. And so one of the trees they took down, you can clearly see a big round top now. We in noticed the, that. <laughs> yeah, in the in the winter, you you could always see it when the leaves were off the tree trees, but now they took this dead tree down and you can see big round top at any time of the year. Um, the other thing is, uh, unfortunately, based on the angle, you can't see where the Cashtown Pass is but you can get a sense of where the village of cash town is and, and where the pass was. Uh, so you can sort of see, I, I think that not necessarily, you know, it, it does show a view of July 1st, but it also shows in a way a view of the Gettysburg campaign. You know, one of my favorite things to do to go up there is to talk about what, what was Lee planning in, in June of 18 May and, and June of 1863. I mean, what, what touched this all up and to be able to go up and see the South mountains and recognize that, yeah, you can't see what's going on in the Cumberland Valley on the other side. And that's what he was banking on that you can get from Virginia up to basically Harrisburg without being detected and that's what he does so you know as sort of a, a, a strategic campaign view um you can you can see that from up there in addition to a more tactical first day view yeah one of my favorite stories too is was with the we like to talk about the first day oak ridge the story of all the, the, the fingers pointing you know pointing north as, as robert rhodes guys are coming down um you know coming down uh, where the peace light is now in that area up there and just, just look up and imagine what that was. Cause when you're standing up there, you can see what to your point exactly with what they saw. Now they have better eyes than we do. They'd see a little cloud of dust. They tell you exactly how many people were there and you know, who was left-handed and they, they can tell anything by that point, but you could, you could get a good idea, but when you're standing up there, your, your mind does tend to, to run you, you know, you got to take the buildings out of your, out of the way yeah. and, and you're mentally, you, you have a really good idea of what, it, what it must've, must've looked like. Um, and that's why, you know, we were saying earlier, the preservation is so important because, you know, in a lot of places, that building is probably gone after that fire. They're just going to take the whole thing down. They're going to build something else. And now because of that, because of the work that you guys have done, as well as some other parts of the town, um, that is able to be shared now. And I think it's something that needs to be promoted. So um, 
you know, right now, if you go up there right now, you can go in, you can see, and it's, 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 it's a fantastic display of the, of the hospitals. Uh, and that, that's the part when I, when I think about it, after the cupola, when I think mostly about my visits, I've been there a few times is those, those, those um, rooms with yeah. the amputations and the soldiers yeah. sitting there. Yeah. And there's my, there's that one guy who's sitting on the bed. Looks like he's texting somebody on his phone. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. He's yeah. like, that is just like, and, and, and like I was telling you before we started recording, uh, one of my friends saw those photos and, and uh, she has worked in a museum in Dubai. She's worked and now she's working in another one in here in Canada. And she said, those are amazing exhibits. And she's, she was in the same field as me, like conservation and exhibit mm -hmm. development and all that. Um, those exhibits you have are not only haunting, um, but they are, they just, they really tell the story well. And I think they show um, somebody from our time, what those men went through. Like you, you sit there and like, there's a guy in a bed, but then there's guys on the floor. Yeah. So clearly this is how many wounded there were. Um, it's, it, it's a really great way to tell the story. Well, and it, it, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because the, the story that I have been told now, I, I was not involved in any of the exhibit design, but a lot of the people that were are, are still around. And one of the stories that I have been told is that um, one of the, the uh, great supporters of the museum, both um, in helping it get established and then also on the exhibit design team is a, is a local doctor. And he went through before opening as they were laying out those, those scenes and he said, it's not bloody enough. And they, the, the designers went back and added more paint, red paint and I, I, it's not egregious, but I think that it is, it is accurate. I, I, you know, this, this was not something that, you know, we should be shielded from and, and something that we should, you know, think that there, well, well there was only a little bit of blood when they did an amputation. No. And these, these surgeons, you look, you look at Carl Schertz's observation of the surgeons at Spangler farm where he says, you know, they're, they're stirred the surgeons rolled sleeves rolled up to the elbows, aprons covered in blood and, uh, you know, next, next, you know, this, this was something that was, was un unfathomable for, for us, but the exhibit at Seminary Ridge, I think starts to get close is real it becomes almost realistic some sense yep. of realistic it it's it's showing and and one of the great things that this museum does is that it shows the human costs of war mm -hmm. you know okay you want to go to war and it's, it's a product of the nine the post 9 11 world you know you want to go to war this is this is what you're going to be facing um so it, it, I think it does a, a really great job of that. And, you know, one of the things that has been very interesting to me is uh, there was a book that was written in 2014 called Learning from the Wounded by Shauna Devine, who's up at Western Ontario. And she does a, a fantastic job of showing that surgeons were better trained than we tend to think that by the midpoint of the war surgeons uh, have been tested and uh, that they are using the civil war to learn about the human body and learn mm -hmm. about injuries and diseases and uh, essentially doing the best they can you know there's no knowledge of germ theory yet but that I guess what I'm trying to say is that the Civil War was not the butcher bloodbath that has traditionally been presented when it comes to medicine. And mm. so we try to to use that scholarship and sort of show that that doctors, you know, did have an idea of what they were doing and were doing the best they could to save soldiers. 
um, but we're, we're hamstrung in some cases by the fact that they didn't know that germs existed. So, uh, you know, we try to be, again, as, as, as close to realistic as possible, I guess is what I'm trying to, to get at. I definitely did a good job of it because I, I yeah. you know, that I'm sure there's been many a nightmare that have come out of that building who've <laughs> gone in there because it's, 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 you know, we, we think about this war, we think about the, you know, so, some of the amputations and what these people went through, but we're visual people, you know, you can read all yeah. you want, but in yeah. your mind sometimes, but people are, especially, you know, people are vis visual and you see that and you see these guys lying in the bed and guy's reading his Bible and he's sitting there and he's all covered in blood and sitting in blood on the floor. And, um, it, it really tells you, you know, it, rem it reminds you that, you know, thousands of people went to the state of Pennsylvania and they never left and they're still there, you know, yeah. and, and they, and, you know, some of the last sites they saw would have been the sites that you'll see when you go into that museum and you yeah, see what the they in, did inside of that building. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the one thing too, that, that you do really well at Seminary Ridge is you capture that for, for those of us that learn visually that need that, yeah. how it looks as a hospital, you capture that. But then you also have the artifacts. You have that handkerchief that <laughs> belonged to Reynolds. Yeah. You you have the actual artifacts as well, which I I know there's some that need to see the actual artifacts for it to seem real to them. Um, I'm a person, I need both. I like to see what, you know, actual things from the battle. But then if I have that display, like in the hospital, I can visualize like, and then can feel what happened you know, and you do that so well at the museum. Thank you. And I yeah. think, I think you need to be commended for that because that's something that is very difficult in the museum field to, um, to be able to do, to be able to bridge that gap between like, okay, we, we need to display artifacts, but artifacts don't always tell the story. They can't, well, well they do, but they can't convey it to us visual learners that need to see. So if we can see that hospital scene, it makes it that much real when we see that handkerchief of Reynolds and when we know his story as well. And, and that's one of the things, one of the many things that this museum that designers did really well is that there is audio, uh, the, the permanent exhibit is called Voices of Duty and Devotion. Mm -hmm. And so as you walk through the museum, you are hearing these voices of people who were in and around the seminary building in, during its history. So you have this auditory element, and then you also have this visual element of both those hospital displays. But one of the things that resonates with people really well is the, uh, the, the paintings by Dale Gallen that were turned into murals. And so, you know, of course, we have no photographs of the first day of the battle, but Dale Gallen did 10 paintings that show historically accurate depictions of sort of what the first day would have looked like. So you, you do get these visual elements that, again, can help those, those learners with different learning styles. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the, the tangible art, and I, people can't touch them, but the artifacts. And uh, the, the story behind that handkerchief was, uh, I guess it was about seven years ago, we were doing an artifact rotation and I was uh, um, talking with Greg Goodell, who is the curator for the National Park Service, really fantastic, one of my favorite people in Gettysburg. And I'm sitting in Greg's office and he says, <laughs> this is how it went. He said, hey, do you want John Reynolds? Yes. I didn't even care what it was. He said, <laughs> If it belonged to John Reynolds, I was taking it, and uh, and and we've we've had it on loan uh, ever since. And uh, yeah, that that's totally one of my one of my favorite pieces because it's like holy shit, that's John Reynolds' handkerchief. <laughs> yeah, that that was actually one of um, one of our questions for you tonight was, what is your favorite artifact? Well, and, like, you just answered it. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, damn, I you know. There, there are so many great artifacts. Um, to go back to the medical stuff, um, one of the things that surgeons were doing during the Civil War was collecting 
specimens and mm -hmm. sending them to the Army Medical Museum in Washington, D.C. So we were able to procure some of these medical specimens from the Army Medical Museum. So we have a knee joint that was amputated in the seminary building. We have uh, a, a scapula, a shoulder blade of a, a soldier that was wounded on July 1st. You know, one of the things that I have been privileged to do is work on these artifact rotations and to, to get these objects that are as connected as possible to what to the story we tell. Um, uh, recently, we, uh, we're, we're actually in the midst of an artifact rotation right now. And uh, we uh, borrowed a stove that was forged at Thaddeus Stevens Ironworks in Caledonia. So it wow. allows us to tell the story of Thaddeus Stevens and the Underground Railroad. And, you know, we somehow got a 400 pound iron cast iron stove out of a second story apartment down a flight of stairs into a van into the museum <laughs> over a railing and into the display but it's it's so cool there it's like how could we not get it see if you got it ikea you could have kind of made it there to okay, it. <laughs> put, it, put it together right yeah yeah but, but there would have been parts missing, missing. and you know don't get, me, don't get me going about ikea as i look around this place <laughs> there would have been parts missing you know but, you know, to talk about you know, the museum now, we, we've been a handful of times. Not, not everybody does. Some people are going to say, well, you know what? I, I don't know a heck of a lot about the Battle of Gettysburg. I don't know if I'm going to go in and spend the money in the place. So we know what you get for your money. So what, when somebody walks in, they pay their fare. What are they going to get when they walk into the museum? What are they going to, you know, what are they going to see? What are they going to experience? Yeah. So it, you, you think about uh, – what you would see at a place like the visitor center, and and I, I I will preface this by saying that the visitor center does a does a fantastic job, and uh, I'm good friends with Wayne and and the park service, and you know it, it gives a, a great you know this level of the Battle of Gettysburg. You know if you are coming to Gettysburg for the first or second time, that's the place to go, but. We consider ourselves complementary and, and a bit of a, a boutique museum that, you know, if you want to start to go down into some of these topics, if you want to really take the first day of the battle and the care of the wounded and the dilemmas that led to the Civil War and really sort of drill down into those issues, this is the place to, to do it. Um, the, the other unique thing that we bring is that we are in the historic building. Um, a lot of times you go to a museum to see artifacts and the museums are in newer buildings and we have the unique perspective of being a quote unquote new museum, 10 years old now, but newish museum but in a building that is 190 years old, going to be 190 years in a few few months. So, um, you know, the floors creak, the doorways are, are askew, uh, the go up to the cupola, the floorboards are original in the attic. So there's this unique sense of, of place um, where it's, it's sort of combining what you might see in like a historic house museum, but it's bringing to the table a, a, a more modern museum where you're seeing objects. So it really, it, it's sort of the, the, the best of all worlds. It's, it, it's, you know, I, I still, and I visit a lot of museums. I'm one of those nerds that when he's on vacation is, is going to museums, but it, it's unique in, in its perspective that you're, it's a, it's an, it's a, a museum in a building where things did happen. Uh, it's not a historic house tour, but it's not a new museum. It's a combination of the, of the, of the two. And if you do we, go up to the cupola, I was going to say, you get, um, you'll get a fantastic story. You don't need to know the battle of Gettysburg if to go to go. 
Uh, most people who listen to this certainly do, but if a newbie comes into town and they go to the cupola, they're going to hear, they're going to have one of your guides who's going to tell them the great story of that first day at the Battle of Gettysburg and what goes on to it. And so you're going to get a really good, um, good high level overview um, of what happened in there. So the people standing in that cupola at that moment can feel, um, you know, feel the story themselves by hearing the story in the place of where something actually literally happened. So they can point out there and say, you know, that's where Robert Rhodes division came down yeah. right over there's where Dorsey Pender broke the line, you know, you know, that, that's, so that's the benefit of, of that instead of hearing it in a, in a class or, or like well, an inside yes. museum. Yeah, and if it, it, it just, it, I, you know, people might say, Oh, you're, you're making this up, but I, I have been there up, up there many times where people have said, Oh, it makes sense now. The first day makes sense now and that's what we that's what we're trying to do is that you know to get up there high and to to be able to see everything that you just said helps people go oh you know yeah i get it and and that's what we want to do and i mean admittedly like darren and i are we are we consider ourselves first day junkies like that's like our our favorite day of gettysburg is the first day best day it, but you know even if your day is Pickett's charge even if it's Culp's hill on july the 2nd go see the seminary ridge museum because it is you know it, it's going to help under you understand the battle that much more and you guys do a lot of events yeah um as we were discovering from your website, like, um, you know, you do virtual ones with different civil war round tables, as yeah. we discovered, you're doing one with the, the Phil Carney civil war round table coming up a couple of weeks yep. as well. Um, but you were telling us before we got started, um, May 27th, uh, the walking tour, the sunset at seminary Ridge. Yeah. So, uh, we, we try to do, Try being the operative word, uh, one event a month, and uh, it 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 varies. We try to do a combination of virtual and in person events because we know that we have people all over the country, and we want them to be able to engage with us as well. So starting uh, towards the end of this month, I guess it's uh, I guess it's three weeks, four weeks from tomorrow, we're gonna pick up on our walking tours again. And mm -hmm. those have been uh, very, very popular. Uh, we, it's free, uh, supported by the Rotary Club of Gettysburg, where we have about an hour long walking tour of the seminary grounds. And on May 27th, we're gonna do uh, the final attack, which looks at the barricade line on the seminary grounds, but looks at it through the eyes of individual soldiers who were holding that barricade line or attacking that barricade line and what they saw, not the people that were saying, hold this line or attack this line. We're looking at the individual soldier. We're also, as we move through the summer, we're going to uh, pick up a, a tour that we started last year called Art and Photography on Seminary Ridge. So looking at all of the various depictions of the seminary building and the ridge over the last hundred and almost 200 years. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the seminary in the battle, which looks at the people who lived on seminary ridge and the students that were there as the battle broke out and what they experienced. Uh, and then a new tour, which looks at some of the architecture of seminary ridge, which tells stories in and of itself is that uh, the seminary, for better or worse, has never knocked down a building in its, in its almost 200 year history. So you look around the campus and you see all these different architectural styles and it tells you a little bit. Uh, so that is all free. It's the last Friday of the month or the fourth, fourth Friday of the month. And um, it's a great way to, to interact and to get out and see like minded friends um, as we, as we move into the fall, one of the events that we did last year for the first time, that was really, really great. It was called 24 hours on the Ridge. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I don't know if you, you knew about this, but it was a fundraiser as part of the 
Adams County Community Foundation's giving spree, we actually kept the museum open for 24 hours. Oh my God. <laughs> so at, at five o'clock, we're supposed to close and we're just like, boom, kept going. And uh, from midnight to 4 a.m., we showed the movie Gettysburg in the galleries. That would be so <laughs> cool. And, uh, and, and, and after, after, so the, the movie ended at, at, you know, 4.15 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we put on Young Frankenstein for about half an hour and watched that. Um, but we did uh, sunset, midnight, and sunrise tours of the cupola. Oh, we wow. had special speakers come in. And it was a, it was a fantastic event. I, I slept there. Uh, I, I, was, I was there. I, I got there at like three o'clock. I'd been there and then I left and then I came back and it was like three o'clock in, in the afternoon. Uh, and I didn't get home until six o'clock the following night. So I was there wow. for, for, you know, 28 hours or something. I, I took a nap. Uh, That's pretty cool though. About an hour and a half. That is uh, so we, cool. Yeah. So we're going to be doing that again. That was, that was a ton of fun. That was my next question. Are you going to be doing that oh, God. event again? Yeah. So when is Somehow, that going to be? Uh, it's going to be November 3rd and 4th, I think, or 4th and 5th. Um, let me see here. I'm bringing up my calendar so I can I can find out. Nice. Uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be November 2nd and 3rd this nice. year. That's very And then... Cool. Uh, uh, so yeah, the big uh, when we get into uh, past the walking tour season, yeah, uh, we go back to doing stuff on on Zoom, um, yeah. and that that allows us to interact with people beyond the, the borders of Gettysburg. So lately, we've had uh, um, speakers come in and and um, you know do a forty five minute half hour half hour forty five minute presentation. Uh, Scott Mingus. Uh, who recently wrote the book on, on well, written mm -hmm. a lot of books, but most recently York County and the Civil War, he gave a talk. Uh, so yeah, the best way to, to keep up with all of that is to look at our Facebook page, look at our website. We, we update regularly about different things that are coming up. Um, we've had wine and paint nights in the museum. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm all about how does how does this become a, an integral part of the community and is not just a museum the other thing that maybe you don't know about is that we designed an escape room in the attic. i saw room. that on your yeah room. <laughs> like that I was so like, what we launched that last <laughs> That's so year cool. and and it's a an an hour-long experience it's after the museum closes and you uh uh, take on the role of a Signal Corps team on July 1st in the attic of the building, responsible for collecting information about the Confederates' advance and relaying that information to Oliver Howard on Cemetery Hill. Oh. Uh, and you have to do that before the Confederates take the building, which is in an hour after you start. And so there are boxes and puzzles and clues and um there's a soundscape so you know there's a speaker that as as the the time starts to run down the cannonballs and 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 bullets uh you start to hear that more as the confederates are getting closer it it's it's and we designed it all in-house and uh um we we ran it i think 20 something times last year and 15 times it was but like it took off like wow unbelievably took off and it's been a lot of fun to see people who you know want to do something after hours or maybe you know don't want to come to the museum although it includes admission just to be able to do something different engage with the the, the museum and the content in a different way well as two people who study howard and appreciate him yeah that is something nice to hear that he's included in that. So uh -huh. that's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. Oh, so done. And of course, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it is in your so much thing, but you know, one thing you can definitely do is do the business. Are you guys doing beer fest again? 
Uh, we're, we're probably going to do something a little bit smaller at some point. Uh, not on the scale that it had been in, in years past. But uh, we're, we're, we're hoping to do something that incorporates breweries and food trucks. Oh, I've been there yeah, for, for shockingly. I've been there a couple of times <laughs> for that. That's a, you know, but, but that, that's always a lot of fun. But, but I think it's a great discussion. I, you know, I think, um, you know, looking at the whole picture, you know, anybody, I've never heard anybody say a bad thing about the, about the whole thing. And you get a really good tour. You can I walk do. around, you can walk around, see this stuff at your own pace. You can take your time. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when it's time to go up to the cupola, someone's going to, is going to bring you up and there's usually other people with you. And, You'll get up there, and um, some people take a little bit longer than others to get up there, like Mary here. But they will, we will get up there, and then you'll have someone actually give you a good guided tour of the whole thing. So even if you yeah. don't know, even if you're not sure what happened or you don't really care what happened, it's an, an awesome place to be to hear the mm -hmm. story. Because, you know, even you, you hear a lot of times people sit there and say, oh, that's so cool. And you don't know, they don't know anything. They don't know from Robert E. Lee to Sara Lee, but they still <laughs> think it's pretty cool. But they think they, it's cool here in the story. They go, Oh, that's really neat. That's pretty cool. Uh, and that's something that they're seeing because they can picture the whole thing going down to the story, which is very, very unique in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a view. I mean, even if, if, you know, some one, one person in a couple likes the museum and, uh, or likes the civil war and the other one, you know, could, could, could care less. It's a great view. It's a beautiful view. It and, is. uh, you know, that counts for something, I hope. Oh, it does. And I like, I mean, I got a second one. What Darren says, like, it's like, you can do a, like so much there. Um, you know, the museum exhibits are amazing. It complements the tour so well. And then you have the escape room, which you could be capturing people that are not into the civil war as much, you know, you got families, you know, you got, you got parents there that, well, we're in the civil war, but our, you know, our tweens or our teenagers, exactly. are not. you can do the escape room. Right. Um, and do all that. It's, it's definitely a place to visit when you were in Gettysburg. Um, and it tells a story it's the exhibits are <laughs> as someone who's been on the other has had to help make exhibits. Wow. Like, I would have loved to have been part of a museum that could know, make exhibits yeah. like that. Like that is like, I just, I saw those exhibits and I'm like, Oh my God, I would have loved to have helped make these exhibits. Um, you guys have done an amazing job in telling the story um, for just all different types of, I'm so into hitting the different types of who, how people learn, but wow. Well, thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. You guys do awesome. And um, thank you for joining us tonight for this. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad that I ran into you both. And I, I look forward to seeing you on the walking tour and, and elsewhere in Gettysburg. If it's not shocking, we ran into us in a bar, which is not no surprise. Not but shocking. That's, uh, that's no, a good no. thing. I did not have a Labatt blue at the time. No, it was on the inside. That's why you couldn't see it. But that's another story. But it's... Uh... <laughs> poor mary never gets away with it but no but, but it's been great having you on here so thanks for joining yeah, us it's great yeah. and uh you know certainly uh we love telling the story we like to mary said earlier we love the first day um you can go anywhere on the first day look over your shoulder and see the and see the seminary and uh and it's just such such a great place to be and it's great that it's been preserved and it's fantastic the work that you guys have done i know it's it's a whole team that you have there yeah. who put all this time and effort into making it so these people can see it um, they may visit it just one time in your entire lives, but they'll remember, they'll remember them, the mannequins and they're going to remember the cupola and they're, uh, they're never going to forget it. So thanks for joining us again, Peter. It's great that you, uh, that you're able to take some time. I know you're busy. You get your PhD stuff going. So taking a few minutes to deal with us knuckleheads for a little you, while. You <laughs> taught me in the, uh, between now and, and, and May 16th, I have a break. So what is that? I have, I have 11 days. So you caught me at a good time oh, to start great. with the summer class. So thank you. <laughs> No, definitely, definitely. All right, Mary, well, that's pretty good. So what's coming up for us? That's next on this, this funny little so show we do. So next on the list, we will do, be doing our usual Facebook Live on Saturday. Next week, we will be talking Yellow Tavern, and then we we will be into Seven Pines. Oh, so Jeb Stewart's on the... We're going to have a lot of fun with the Jeb people next week, Mary. Yeah. You better get your, you better get your yeah. kettle already for that one. Yeah, and a Canadian is involved with Jeb, Stu Jeb Stewart, so doesn't too well not too well all right well we got some fun stuff coming down the pike so any final words from you Fincheru? 
Well, thank you uh, to Peter for joining us tonight for this episode. It was awesome to discuss this. Uh, thank you to, to you, Darren, for being the amazing co-host you are with this and all our listeners. You guys rock. We do. We do. All right. We appreciate everybody. Thanks for joining us. So we look forward to seeing you as we like to say, Mary, on the other side. Yep. Here we go. Do, 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 do